Great. So let's start the day, guys. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone who have registered for this great webinar from different countries and want to witness the great session happening today. Good day from AI Course for team to everyone. Hope you and your family are doing safe. Today is the great webinar we are going to see which talks about how technology is driving the media transformation. Now to begin with, let me introduce myself and the company to you. My name is Nitin Naveen and I'll be your host for the day. I'm working as Vice President Innovation Strategy at AI Core Spot. I have great experience around a couple of decades in consulting firms dealing in and around the emerging technologies. Further, I've been joined by my colleague Arvind and Naveen who will also assist me in keeping the event lively and resolving technical glitches if it comes in between. So thanks a lot to them for putting in hard work and making this one a huge success. Try to provide a seamless experience to all of you so that you can gain maximum output out of the same. Let me provide a brief background to all of you about AI Core Spot. We started a couple of years backed up by InfoVision, who is our knowledge and innovation partner, and Digit7, who is our technology partner. Our mission is to serve as a hub for information regarding Industry 4.0 technologies. The focus is to provide all of you a deep dive in all the sectors wherever technology is there. And every month we have a different theme. We are gaining momentum month on month. Our aim is to be number one AI-driven community all over the world so that like-minded people like you can be a part of the same in supporting, growing, and making it a success. The focus is to do industry-backed webinars and hybrid events. The knowledge base will be made from reliable data through industry leaders, subject matter experts, thought leaders, and our partners. We'll enrich the content through digital content, podcasts, blogs, videos, newsletters, and many other things to shed light on the ever-evolving industry. Today, we are having a lovely and unique webinar around the great theme which lays emphasis on future of media and entertainment with digital transformation. So if you want to know how the companies use technology to meet their customers in every step of the customer journey or experience, role of technology within monetization, adapting to business models, the importance of personalization and customization in media and entertainment content, role of chat GPT and much more, then you are in the right place. We'll try to go all over it throughout the panel discussion and give lots of insights to you. There are lots more in store for next month. We'll focus on different technologies like AI, ML, blockchain, IoT, AR, VR, digital twins, metaverse, quantum computing, and so on. So request all of you to go through our website, which is aicodespot.io for future updates. Also, please like our social media handles, which will keep you all updated on everything what we propose to offer in the coming months to follow. Before starting with the day, I would like to highlight a few things so that it can set up the tone for the amazing learning and networking day. Special mention about our knowledge and innovation partner, InfoVision, who has supported us since beginning and provided us the right support to bring the community together. Some brief about InfoVision. It's an end-to-end -end IT and business service provider specializing in providing technology transformation and innovation projects for over 25 years across multiple industries. They serve 12 global locations, including US, Latin America, Middle East, and India. They also have a unique state-of-the-art research and innovation lab named Digit7 in Richardson with five great innovative products. So to get in touch with them, kindly log on to the website, which is infovision.com and leave your details through the contact us section. Now moving on, coming to our community partners for today it includes five great companies, Mars Wrigley, Maggie Corporation, Crackhouse Entertainment Group, SXM Media, and Brightco, who came together to make this webinar a success. Special mention to attendees of the event who registered and came today to achieve their objectives through this forum. At the end of the day, if you gain few things out of this, get to network with each other, our core objective as a platform will be achieved. Further, if anybody wants to ask questions, they can type it in the Q&A section. You can type in as and when the panel member speaks and we'll try to get it answered as per the time permitted. Now let me hand over the stage to Ashish, who is the Chief Business Officer handling telecom, media, and technology at InfoVision, and who is the moderator for this panel discussion as well. He's joined by five great leaders, Deepak, Marco, Stacy, Kaleg, and Scott, and they will give their introduction subsequently. So over to you, Ashish, to begin this exciting panel discussion. Thanks, Nathan. Uh, thanks for setting the stage up. And um, it's my pleasure to host this webinar today with the great speakers um, on this call. 
Um, I think I would say about 200 plus years of experience, uh, we, we all to total bring it together. So I think our audience will be privileged to listen and hear from you guys on various things uh, which are driving the complete transformation in the media industry. I, everyone will agree last three years uh, since the COVID came in, uh, the demand for media has gone up uh, significantly. And people are now looking at various ways to watch the content, the mm -hmm. right content, the different type of content, and also our uh, devices, different type of devices they would love to, they would like to see. Even if you look at the, you know, from the segmentation standpoint, millennials and the and Gen Zs, we did the survey and the kind of time they are spending on the devices and the online content is, is very different than what it used to be. And technology is a big driver in driving this, providing the best experience, best uh, uh, quality, best content. And that is where this webinar is going to be really relevant uh, uh, for today's uh, conversation. I would really sincerely encourage and request all our audiences to please post your questions as much as you can so that you can, all the speakers can give their point of view uh, and you can get to know more and more. With that, I'll, I would like to start with, uh, with our list of questions, what we have today for each speaker. And Scott, I want to start with you. Customer experience is something which is very, very important for in today's world. And uh, how you are seeing the, you, you know, you are, you, you and your company is able to change the, or bring the better experience leveraging the technology in the media space. Sure. Thank you. And uh, thank you to everybody. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening, wherever you are in the world. Uh, my name is Scott Levine. I'm the head of product for Bright Cove. Um, I joined Bright Cove uh, about six months ago. Um, pretty excited to be here uh, after a long career at uh, Televisa Univision and AOL before that. Um, and I'm just excited to be taking part in this journey of building uh, our vision to being the most trusted streaming technology company in the world at Bright Cove. Uh, so th the question really is is kind of a cool one, which is, you know, how is technology evolving here to meet customers, whether that's where they are, where you want them to be on diff different distribution platforms, as media companies, as consumers, we're all as brands, we're all trying to get closer together to our customers, to our audiences, to our viewers, to the brands that are out there. You could be a big media company creating the next hot series, and it's about how do I get closer to them? Whether that's through technology that distributes your content to plat platforms and partners, whether that's through new uh, forms of monetization like FAST or SVOD services, whether that's with advertising or with subscriptions, or if you want to take a different look at that, maybe it's about getting closer to your audience as a brand, as a marketer. And in that case, it's about delivering video, audio, other types of media to get closer to that audience. In those cases, it's about using video and audio to wow and delight, to inform and to empower and to drive the types of engagement that you want to. Some things that like we've seen over time is like 85% of consumers you know, in the world find that watching video is essential as they shop online. So that's an example of how getting closer to your audience is so powerful. And when you see the types of technologies, distributions, new forms of monetizations that are coming, that rate of change is what is powering that getting closer to your audience. It's one of the things that I'm so excited about being at Bright Cove about also is like that rate of change and being able to be part of the platform that enables that is a great place to be for our customers and for their audiences. Yeah. Thanks, Scott. Thank you so much. And uh, Kelly, I know um, uh, you guys are also focusing on how do you how do you guys get closer to close uh, closer to the customers, and uh, how is technology allowing you to reach to the customers, be close to them? Uh, would love to hear your uh, thoughts. Yeah. Um, before I get started and answer that question, I do want to introduce myself. 
Uh, I'm Kaylee McMurray. I'm head of industry for CPG at SXM Media. And if you don't know SXM Media, we're really the sales organization for the consumer facing brands of one Sirius XM, two Pandora, and three Stitcher. We also have exclusive ad partnerships with SoundCloud, NBC Universal, and Audio Chuck, which produces the number one podcast of all time, Crime Junkie, and a personal favorite of mine. So if you were to take away one thing from what I just said, you can think of us as really your one-stop shop for everything audio, across streaming, podcasts, and satellite. And just quickly a bit about myself. I've been at SXM Media for a year and a half, but prior to that, I was working at Clorox on the brand engagement side. And before that, I had spent about eight years on the media agency side. So I really have a wealth of knowledge on all things media, especially in the CPG space. So hopefully that gives you a bit of background as I answer some of the questions and chime in during uh, the panel discussion, which I'm really excited to be here today. Thank you. Um, but to answer your question, Ashish, so how technology is allowing us to get closer to our consumers, I think the biggest thing um, is really our ability to personalize at scale. And at SXM Media, we specifically do that through digital audio. We know for CPG brands today, personalization is so, so important. And really these mass reach campaigns are no longer sufficient as consumers really expect products and ads to be personalized. Our brands are at risk of losing loyalty. And I think you can think of that as especially true during this economy and particularly with those younger consumers who often switch brands um, and don't have that same brand loyalty as uh, older generations. Uh, so when I talk about personalization and our strengths there, I like to use the example of the beauty category. We have so many uh, brands that define beauty for what their consumers uh, or define beauty for their consumers. And a lot of that is through, you know, visuals, uh, images, videos, et cetera. But audio really allows consumers to define what beauty means for them. And this is super powerful when you need to resonate uh, with those consumers. So this is a simple but yet effective way to personalize. And I also want to touch on uh, data because data is really important as we think about our ability to personalize at scale um, through technology platforms. And for a lot of our clients, we leverage a mix, a healthy mix of first party data, second party data, and third party data in order to drive that business growth for our clients. And our tech stack allows us to apply custom messages to these various data segments to ensure it's relevant and we're reaching these consumers at the right time. So we love this approach because we can control how much spending is going towards these various segments and optimize based on what's working. Um, so this is really, it's allowed us to become so much more efficient in reaching our audiences with that message that's going to resonate with them, which a mass reach tactic, it's much more difficult to do and often more costly uh, for a lot of our consumers or for a lot of our um, brands to execute against. Thank you so much. And I think you brought brought up some good points and uh, I know Deepak will be looking forward to, uh, you know, uh, talk about it. You talked about data. You talked about how you are leveraging different type of data to bring the personalization and uh, mm. being close to your customers. And uh, there is not better person than Deepak can talk about it. Uh, he, is, uh, he is a global senior director, one demand data and analytics. So Deepak, uh, you know, please share with, with, the, with, the, with everyone how you are leveraging data, you and your team, and what work you are doing um, to bring that personalization and uh, supporting the business. Absolutely, absolutely. First of all, I'm really excited to be here and I'll do a quick introdu introduction from my side as well. I'm Deepak Jose. I'm the global head of One Demand Data and Analytics Solutions at uh, Mars Snacking. Um, and uh, I always tell this in a uh, virtual audience, if uh, I, I were in person with you, I would have started by giving you some M&Ms and Snickers to start with uh, this discussion. <laughs> so probably next time we are going to meet in person, that's where I, how I'll start our discussion. With. Come on over, bud. So, Let's have those snacks. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so, uh, uh, so uh, I've been with Mars for the last four years, and uh, as part of one demand data and analytics. 
one of the key objective that we are trying to accomplish is to how can we supercharge 100 percentage of the decision making in the organization with data and analytics that is the fundamental aspect of what we are trying to accomplish in the organization so uh, i i have a global remit and uh, as part of uh, one of the key objective that i am trying to drive in this conversation is how can we break the silos within the organization so that we can give a holistic connected decision making now uh, my my background uh, is in cpg data and analytics i used to be with coca cola i've done analytics consulting for a period of time uh, so and this is a challenge that it is not only applicable to mars it is applicable to many cpg companies and manufacturers uh, out there in the world now uh, let me tell you how we are leveraging media transformation to give a integrated consumer journey and integrated brand experience now uh, so you, if you think about mars as an organization we interact with our consumers through different touch points uh, through our on platform touch points and off platform touch points so uh, off platform touch point as we call it as uh, we have the search engines we have the social media so that is what we call as the off platform touch points and on platform touch points we think about it in three different areas we have the pure place like amazon.com alibaba etc we have the brick and clicks walmart.com the tesco carrefour etc when it comes to on demand delivery aggregators uh, instacart Deliveroo, Deliveroo Hero, etc. In addition to that, I'm sure that if if you if you check mnms.com, you will get some custom mnms, which is our D2C business. If you, I'm sure that you might have gone at least once to an mnm store uh, around the world. So there are multiple touch points uh, you know, for us with consumers. Now this is a complex omni-channel world, and giving that integrated brand experience, giving that integrated consumer journey is very tough. But how do how does a large CPG organization operate? Uh, see, if 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 you think that consumer is the elephant in the room, many of you might have heard the story of four blind people explaining an elephant, right? Like somebody touches the leg, somebody touches the trunk, somebody touches the tail, and explaining uh, different things, and that's what happening in the organization. The sales ex explains the consumer a certain way. The marketing team explains the consumer a different way. Supply chain team different explains the uh, about the consumer a different way, and that needs to change because it is we need to build that single source of truth, which is our consumer, and the consumer should be in the heart of the decision making. So when we build out the one demand data and analytics solutions function at Mars, we thought about how can we break the silos between sales and marketing, for example to have one single source of truth so that they talk about the consumer in the same way. So that is the foundation of what we are trying to accomplish uh, within the team. Now, whatever we are doing, uh, I mean, um, um, earlier Kelly mentioned about integrating uh, first party, second party, and third party data. These days, we also uh, think about zero party data as well. Right? Like, How can we build out that integrated data strategy in the purpose of driving that integrated brand experience. So that is one of the key outcome that we are driving at Mars. Sure, thank you, Deepak. Thank you so much. I, I, I love I it. One, uh, just building on one piece there. I mean, I think another piece on the CPG side where we operate in silos is we think about like shopper versus national media dollars. And as we think about getting closer to the consumer, we need to be mo more focused on what does the consumer want to see where they are or um, d depending on their search behaviors or their lifestyle, like how can we anticipate better what they need to get in front of them at that particular moment versus having these silos of shopper versus national dollars because the consumer doesn't care if it's a national ad versus a shopper ad and they don't talk to each other. So how do we get exactly. more integrated in that approach in order to come forth with this consolidating consolidated messaging strategy for that consumer. So that's top of mind for me this year is re retail media networks are booming and um, popping up and that second party data, which is so important for CPG brands is really gonna be key to helping bridge that gap. And, and Absolutely, and Kelly. I'll join yeah, yeah. I mean, I couldn't agree more with Kelly and I think this is the challenge that we are facing. So. 
think about retail media networks one part of the organization shopper marketing uh, team manages a part of it uh, uh, sometimes it is ma- managed by the media team in some cases it is an e-commerce team the sales team manages some aspect of uh, retail media network i could say i think the complex organization in itself one of the biggest challenge that we are facing is how can we have that integrated approach when it comes to targeting our consumers leveraging retail media network and integrating into our national media strategy so couldn't couldn't agree more uh, scott over to you yeah so uh, it's it's funny because with the words that everybody's using here it's nice we didn't practice this beforehand everybody this is actually live and unscripted uh you know i talk about it and we talk about it a lot of source of truth and the democratization of data deepak what you're talking about is integrating everybody together to bring people together what kali you're talking about is how do you make more informed decisions the thing we always talk about and i see one of the questions in here is how do you take data analytics and act on it is it's not just about big data. People talk about big data all the time. And it's not just about data that leads to insights. It's data that leads to insights that leads to actions, whether it's driving a sales campaign, whether it's getting customers to be more engaged, whether it's finding the right content for them. That's what this is all about. And I, I, I love your notion of how do you bring everybody together, Deepak? It's very near and dear to our hearts. It's, we actually acquired a company last year called Wicket labs just for this purpose to really jump start and lean into something which is very near and dear to us which is data as source of truth for everything and if you don't believe them my boss actually just wrote me an email five minutes ago asking about data to get some answers so all of this is very true very applicable to our real world lives <laughs> you know someone was telling me uh, uh, data is going to be the biggest currency in the world in the next couple of years so today you know every every country has a different currencies but every currency will standardize to data as a currency and mm-hmm. it is it is being talked about it is going to be a 50 trillion dollar as a as a currency they're putting a value so data is going to be a is going to be everything and uh, there is so much we can talk about when it comes to data from data quality to data governance and then how we are getting the different channels together and making a personalized decisions getting closer to the customers all those things are about data so yeah i think i i, I completely agree with what all the speakers are bringing it here and you know little bit changing the gear of really quickly think about the example of bed bath beyond i mean they're closing so many retail locations they are you know underwater and they're coming out with their new me- retail media network because they see more value in their data sets that they have access to specifically in the shopper space. So, you know, despite them as a company doing so poorly and closing all these uh, retail locations, they see value in their data sets that they have uh, thus far, both online and in store. So I just think that that's a nice example of how important data is as we um, now and as we move into the future. That's good. And and then let's move uh, you know moving on to a little different topic, Stacy. Uh, you know uh, today the cell phone use usage and the and the device usage has gone so much. And when I was talking about in the beginning, especially during the pandemic, people are sitting at home. You know uh, more and more consumption. Uh, what is your view about uh, second and third screen now, and how they are becoming more and more relevant uh, uh, in today's world? Thank you for your question. I'll do a brief introduction so that people have a concept of where I'm coming from. My name is Stacey Robinson. I currently work at Trackhouse Media Entertainment Group. It's a startup. I've been there for about a month. And uh, they own a NASCAR team. They have partnerships with music artists, other athletes uh, like James Hahn, the American golfer. They have partnerships with um, celebrities and they're just trying to make a splash in the media and entertainment world. And because it is a startup, there are big dreams, big hopes. And I was brought in as the executive director of digital and social to help them build that out. So relevant to my other panelists, um, I'm working with social media, I'm working with .com, working a lot with data to try to get that evidence to show what's working for our consumers because we are a B2C company trying to provide entertainment to our consumers. So speaking of consumers, I bet 
all of my salary that most of you have your cell phone in your hand right now. And if you don't have your cell phone in your hand, you probably have a big screen right behind your medium screen that's on right now. Yep, there we go. Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I will also bet my salary that most of you have already checked your phone multiple times during this webinar, even though we've only been talking for a couple of minutes. So it is deeply integrated into our lives, even into our muscle memories, that we are going to be using multiple screens. That's what I mean by second and third screen. You might be watching this on a monitor or on your laptop, but I know for a fact that our minds won't allow us to just focus on one thing. We're doing multiple things all the time, and that's fine. That's how, that's how we are coping with this new digital world. Um, that said, it gives us as businesses an advantage because we know we have, well, both an advantage and a disadvantage because we know we have multiple opportunities to capture your attention. So disadvantage because there are lots of options. I'm sure you guys turned it, tuned in to see this webinar, but you're answering emails. Like I just mentioned, I got an email from my boss. I definitely saw the ping and read the, read the headline. I'm sure you've gotten text messages from friends or family. I'm sure you've gotten a notification that you have another meeting starting in an hour. Um, so there's lots of competing distractions. However, having that second and third string screen does give us the advantage. Uh, let's talk sports and entertainment because that's where my specialty lies in. Before I worked at Trackhouse, I was working at Fox Sports. I worked a little bit at Nike. I worked at NASCAR. Um, so. Let's specifically focus on a live show. Let's say whatever your sports team is, mine is UNC Chapel Hill, go Tar Heels. We played last night. It's fine, but I'm watching them on the TV. You're still in it. You're still in it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I'm watching them on the TV. I've got my Twitter stream up, watching people commenting about the game, and I'm following along on my small screen. So I have a small screen, a medium screen, and a big screen. I have three screens up. So that is multiple availabilities to capture my attention. So let's say Mars is popping up on an advertisement. Okay, cool. Now I'm hungry for a Snickers. So I really want to order DoorDash and go get a Snickers. What prompted me to go get that? Well, I have an advertisement and then I'm scrolling on my screen and I see, oh, uh, well, there's another game. So I'm going to program my time to focus on that other game and focus on those tweets. And then I see someone funny talk about Sirius XM and they're going to and there's a new Crime Junkie episode out. So I have that capture from Crime Junkie because I'm on a multiple screen. And this is applicable for more than just gathering attention and changing our minds. This can be for uh, emphasizing what you're watching. So if you're in a brick and mortar, now let's focus less on entertainment, more on retail. So if I'm in the M&M store and I get a ping saying, hey, go spin the wheel, you can win a free prize. I don't actually know if there's a wheel, so I'm making this up, but I get a, a, a location ping on my phone that I can go get a, a free prize just because I have registered that I am physically in the Mars store. So there's lots of ways that our second and third screens can be both an advantage to our businesses and a disadvantage because we are competing with so many other things that are happening. And I can guarantee you that while I was talking, some of you checked your phone. So I think I just proved my point. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think uh, it's a it's a it's a great articulation. And I can uh, uh, two things which I would say. I'm reading a book right now with Johan Hari. He's one of the best author and uh, best-selling book, Lost Focus, because we are always on the multiple screens. And uh, the books, big book is talking about how we lose our focus because of the screens which we are in, right? I will, on Saturday, Sunday, I will be watching one iPad on soccer. Then there's an NFL game going on. Then there is this thing going on. So there are three devices around me, which will always be there. So completely agree, uh, you know, what you are talking about, Stacey. So that's the trend today. And thanks for sharing your perspective. And, uh, you know, uh, we talked about uh, customers. We talked about how we are reaching close to the customers. We talked about technology, which is uh, taking us to the close to the customers. And let's hear from uh, Marco, who is the EVP and chief marketing officer, how he is seeing, uh, you know, his perspective around the market today, especially we are listening our word every day, every, every, every here and there, recession, 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 how the things are 
Uh, so would love to hear your perspective and what uh, you are seeing consumer behaviors and the business behaviors are, uh, Marco. So please share your perspective. Yeah, so I'm Marco Di Giacomo. I'm the person who runs marketing, among other things, for Amagi. Uh, for the startup community out there, Amagi is a unicorn backed by Axel. We've actually increased our valuation in this time frame, which proves you that it is possible uh, to do so with a, an extra investment for General Atlantic. And really what we do is we serve the media and entertainment industry in particular with their technology needs for live video. Uh, because I am, uh, among other things, running our marketing organization and because I spent time at Verizon, Microsoft, Cisco, Atlassian, Evernote, a few other names that you may recognize, uh, the observations that I have are both as somebody who sells the technology and, for lack of a better term, uses the technology when it comes to advertising. And uh, to your point, uh, I think, uh, uh, Stacey, the thing that is fascinating is what is happening to the behavior that customers and consumers have in terms of having moments that are at the same time of solitude with the small screen and of, uh, if you want, socialization with the big screens. Because while it's true that everybody is watching both television and their cell phone very often, it's also true that the two experiences are very different in that one is personal to you. I would challenge anybody to give their cell phone to another person and not to feel literally naked. Um, the other, television in particular, we have ample data, is a social experience. More than 80% of the people that watch television watch it with at least another person. Now, the data that Amagi has from primary research that we've done is the fact is in many respects pretty intuitive. What we're seeing is that if you're a media and entertainment company in times of recession, your subscription business is going to come under attack. The numbers change very widely from 30% in the US to close to 60% in New Zealand. But subscribers will look very hard at the expense that they have for their cable or small business in general. And most of them, to the tune of 70%, we look at that as something that they can switch to an app based model. So being able as a media and entertainment company to have both models and or to be able to switch from a subscription model to an app based model is more and more critical, not just to your success, but in some respects to your survival. Sure, thank you, Marco. Um, anyone has any point Any point to add here? Uh, uh, otherwise we can move to the next uh, section. I mean, okay. you think at the point of, like subscription versus revenue, I mean, I think too, as a company that's been a priority for us, I mean, we push uh, and different from our competitors, right? Who focus on that subscription model um, in a, a tight time during this economy, they are leaning into more of the ad, subs, uh, ad subscription model, um, which is our platform. And we have been seeing a lot of success there for that free content uh, with shorter advertising formats. And that's really worked for us and proven to be successful. So I, I definitely hear you on that model proving to be valuable, especially during this economy. Yeah. And it, it goes towards, you know, what Marco was saying a second ago, like the flexibility of being able to move between different types of offering subscription to advertising, advertising back to subscription. I think you could look at any major streaming uh, provider that's out there today, and they're all struggling with this option reality, which is, do I go fully ads? Do I go fully subscription? Do I put ads in the middle? Even you know, big ones like Netflix have added the ad tier as an option because there's opportunities to find consumers and find the right monetization opportunity for them. We sort of let water find its right level. And that optionality and that freedom to move between business models is a gift in this day and age because you can try new things. You can try new content uh, ideas. You can try new subscription packages. You can try new ways of engaging with audiences. Yeah. I think the thing that to me is going to be interesting, Scott, is this, you know, I've worked at Verizon, who's had the, a 
20 plus years experience of subscription business as every telecommunication player out there. And I've worked at that base businesses. And the thing is whether it's a two way street or really a one way street for consumers, meaning we have data that shows a, hey, in a recession, I'm going to go from paying the subscription to advertise based content. Um, I haven't seen a lot of people go. And now that I, the economy is on demand, I'm feeling richer. I'm going to go back to spending money on subscription. In many respects, it was something that I personally found fascinating about the uh, old iTunes model, which is we went from radio, which was ad based to something that was subscription based and be interesting to see whether that shift is a shift that can occur periodically between the two or tends to be more in one direction or the other. Um, yeah, I'm old school. I listen to the radio, so I'm for ad based, but you know, time will tell. Yeah, no, I think it if you the look at the... of the user, right? Like how many ads are they getting? Is it, you know, I have started to see on YouTube now, it's like, oh, you've got 15 ads to view and I'm sitting there. At, I'm annoyed. I'm frustrated. So, you know, there's a difference between the quality and quantity of ads you're getting um, and what you're willing to be comfortable with in, in order to lean into that uh, ad revenue uh, base. So I, I, think think Ali, though, that's, yeah. I think, Ali, though, that's where AI is going to change the game quite a bit in the fact that if you think about it at least in my eyes you use exactly the expression that one would explain you would use which is it's annoying but it's annoying because it's a break in the experience and it's mm -hmm. a break in the experience because if you think about what happens today we inject an ad meaning we take something that is extraneous to the experience of the customer listening to something or doing something and we break the experience and, send, and then we send them back. What's happening with generative adversarial networks of which uh, uh, chat GPT as an example is you're able to actually uh, create a synthetic experience that blends the two. And again, you're seeing it uh, in text today with GPT chat effectively, with chat GPT effectively creating new content, content based on existing content. You'll see it in audio, I would assume, quite frankly, next, and we're getting ready for it in video. Because what you'll start seeing is that, as an example, as you're watching a movie or a game, the advertisement actually becomes part of the experience because it's with the same character, people, etc. I can't remember who was telling me that, that they recently watched a game in which the advertisement was actually the same people that normally commented the game advertising the products. And so it didn't feel as much of a break as it felt before. Now, to your point, there's always the art of what's the load of ads that is going to be the maximum profit with the optimal level of annoyance. Uh, but not everybody is on an iPhone, somebody would say. And that's a testament to the fact that at the end of the day, most of the people would rather get the ad experience than shell out extra money. Does it make sense? Yeah. yeah. I, I... I think also to to jump to continue on Marco's thread there is if you think about like even simple things that you see in uh, seasonality of advertising, Q1s are generally lighter than Q4s where people need to push more inventory. You see ad experiences that are common throughout it where people create pods, right? It's just a thing we all think about. And it's the same length of pod generally most of the time. Being able to dynamically change that for Cali versus Marco versus Scott in real time, knowing my tolerance for what I'm watching or being able to say, you know what, I'm really, really vested in this movie that I'm watching, but there's a natural break in three minutes. Maybe I put a little ad there and then come back to a bigger ad. That concept of using data to watch viewing patterns and really act on. And when you marry that with. Your advertising needs, your advertising demands, your revenue demands, and you can put it together. You could really change the game here. You know, we see it every single year where at the beginning of the year, demand from advertisers drops, and you sort of have to find ways of filling those gaps. What if you just offered a user a better user experience, got them really, really engaged right now? That's a really, really healthy subscriber or user in the future. 
Um, I, 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 one another aspect that I want to add to this conversation, but before I get there, so among the panelists, how many of you guys have might have seen the M and M's ad during the Super Bowl? Any of you have seen at least one? Yes. Okay. Very good. Very good. So I think I, this is some a fantastic engagement. Uh, our North America marketing team had executed this year. Now, uh, and if, if you have been hearing the story, and I'll if for people who have not seen, right? Like when uh, the the theme was around the M and M's characters, which are near and dear to our consumers, they were taking a break. And with uh, our uh, ever-loving uh, Maya Rudolph, we built out a uh, campaign. So instead of M and M's, it was for a period of time we had a specialized packaging called Maya and Yas. And this engagement uh, was, I mean, it started almost several weeks before uh, the Super Bowl, and there were a lot of ads which went up to it. And our consumers started responding to it in a fantastic way. Now, the impact of so generally in the past, right? Like I mean, uh, there was a lot of value attributed to uh, the M the to the spot, the 30 second spot that any uh, manufacturer or a brand company would play during the Super Bowl. But in this case, what we have seen even before the Super Bowl, there were more than several billion impressions about what we are what is the story that we are planning to tell so essentially what i'm trying to tell in the uh, uh, in this example is like there is much beyond the spot that we are planning to play it is the experience it is the continuous engagement that you can do with your consumers so that 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 is going to definitely add up so for us Eminem's characters and how they are taking a break and after uh, Super Bowl, they came back starting to do the job. That story in itself, our consumers really loved it, especially the Gen Z. And Eminem's is one of the most uh, recognized brand by Gen Z based on Morningstar, right? Like, I mean, so I think uh, the idea of thinking about, hey, let's have a media spot that is going to add value, it is definitely, but I think we have to think beyond to talk about that uh, integrated consumer journey how can we inspire them how can we think about when they are planning for a particular event how can we inspire them when we think about when a consumer thinks about going for shopping when they are buying when they are consuming so that uh, integrated consumer journey we call it the consumer journey hexagon at march i think that is going to be very important sure I know, Stacey, you have a you have an example on the disruptive media and the Super Bowl uh, uh, example is something you, you wanted to share with your audiences. So uh, please share. Yeah, actually, I think I'm going to upset Deepak a little bit and say that the commercials on the Super Bowl aren't as impactful anymore. There's, I think this relates back to our, we need to use data and we need to be aware that there's lots of distractions in the digital world. So if you are watching the Super Bowl, I mean, the sport, the teams that were playing this year weren't all that great. There wasn't a bunch of people rallying around to watch that. So they're naturally going to be tuning in for what's supposed to be impressive commercials and an awesome halftime show. But I was sitting, and this was, yes, a small a small survey of people. We were all sitting, and we noticed that for the past couple of years, the commercials have already been pre-released. So there's no anticipation. There's no excitement. There's no disruption to catch our attention during the Super Bowl like there was before, especially for these commercials that are supposed to be extremely expensive because these ad dollars, especially for one of the biggest, most viewed entertainment periods on TV are so high. And I think we can talk about advertising here and dollars and making sure that the consumer is actually paying attention to it. Um, I don't think these Super Bowl ads are, are as impressive or as disruptive or as captivating as they used to be. They've become annoyances. They've become roadblocks between a football game and the halftime. So unfortunately, I'm sitting with these people. We're all like, yeah, I mean, it's fine. It's okay. Mm -hmm. It's it's not what it, it used to be. Or we would say, oh, wait, I've already seen this commercial. It was on my Netflix 
or Hulu ad because I don't have the paid Hulu. So it came on Hulu the other week. And so you're noticing that, unfortunately, these opportunities to grab attention, and this relates back to, you know, all of the advertising chats we were having. How do you do this in an appropriate way on one of the multiple screens that we're all using? How do you do this to actually grab attention? So I don't think there truly is disruptive media anymore because there's so much going on. Again, this is back to my point of like an advantage and a disadvantage that we have this many opportunities to reach our consumers. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And I think, uh, Stacey, uh, sorry, go for it. Okay. Uh, just really quick. So I think on that point, it's really interesting because we've been watching this trend a lot, um, knowing we're a music-based company and we're so focused on entertainment. and. The Super Bowl halftime show has been a huge part of the Super Bowl. And Pepsi's decision last year to walk away from that after so many years of being involved in that said a lot, particularly in the CPG space, saying, you know, our costs of these mass reach, you know, prior they were very disrupted, garnered a lot of attention and, and still do, don't get me wrong. But, you know, we just came out that $7 million is the average 30 second uh spot cost for advertisers in the super bowl and pepsi said you know it's great we're just still going to support it you know the nfl and the super bowl in general but we see more value in reaching our younger cohorts on a more evergreen basis throughout the course of the year because they're engaging in entertainment and content very differently than these older generations or how you know, previous consumers have engaged with entertainment. So it's really this shift and let's reach them in more evergreen type programs versus these one splashy moments that are extremely costly, definitely garner a lot of attention. And if you have the budgets, that's amazing. It's definitely a part of the strategy, but it can't be the only strategy anymore. And your dollars can go further uh, if they are spread out and reaching younger cohorts in a different way. I think to what the two of you were saying, I would add one thing, which is uh, um, what we will need to see is how the experience evolves in this respect. A lot of people seem on television to still be treating television as the, for lack of a better term, analogic experience that it was. And so you have issues like the ones that Stacy you were mentioning of, but I've already seen this ad. This though is a self-inflicted wound because in this day and age, with the IP address of your internet connected television, you have information about what has and has, already, has not been already shown in that specific household, which you happen to know about because you happen to know where the beautiful cell phone spends eight hours during the night. So the thing that will be interesting is how much of these are the uh, issues of a, an industry that needs to reinvent itself as it moves to digital versus how much of this is a barrier that will exist forever for lack of a better term certainly these big events big live events have a unique asset which is they can attract a massive amount of eyeballs at the same time and so if what you're trying to do is the start of a race and get a point in which you know that everybody will start at the same time there's nothing that can replace them. But I agree with you. The ability that I know I have, now I have to reach millions of consumers with one medium has been extended from the Super Bowl to YouTube to pretty much any online platform, especially TikTok. And so it'd be interesting to see how television adapts, because if it doesn't, I agree with you, the value will continue to deteriorate. I do believe that with digital, they have the ability, though, especially because of the privacy laws that are coming in for the other platforms to actually reclaim some of the benefits that they had. So uh, we have got a couple of uh, questions uh, from audiences, and uh, I uh, would love uh, each and every speaker to give their perspective uh, for each question. Uh, but before we go to the questions, the last point which I want to uh, complete is we, we talked about, uh, you know, uh, digital adoption, how digital uh, technologies are, are enabling to have a better customer experience, monetization, and so on and so forth. What are the challenges you guys are seeing in your respective area? 
uh, when it comes to adoption, right? And Deepak, I'll start with you. Uh, how what challenges you are seeing within the organization uh, in terms of driving the initiative which are around data and analytics space? Yeah. So I think uh, when it comes to uh, media transformation, I think I'll talk about the data and analytics and about the media transformation in general as well. And I think I'll give my perspective not only from uh, from from the Mars side. Uh, I think from industry, what I have seen as well. First, I think, uh, I mean, there is a fundamental challenge that we are facing. Uh, the marketers of the past used to take a lot of uh, gut-based decision-making process, and we have to encourage them to do data-driven decision-making. So that's a significant shift. Now, are we helping uh, the new generation marketers are we training them upskilling them is one of the key questions that we need to ask ourselves and that is something that we are uh, essentially focusing on at mars so essentially uh, we are going through several training programs upskilling programs so that uh, instead of moving away from a hey here is what i did in the past this is what i'm going to do now how can we change that mindset so that is one aspect well, and this is a huge challenge that we are facing and we are making some significant progress in this area. The second area where uh, I, I, I think is about the mindset of uh, the data analytics and the media platforms. Uh, uh, and I, I generally tell this story to my marketing leadership team on the importance of how to build the right kind of uh, capability when we are thinking about building these platforms. Uh, and probably in the panelists, how many of you have heard the story of the Honduran bridge? Any, anybody? No. Okay. So let me humor you all with the story. Uh, so uh, in 1940s, the Honduras, the Central American country, the country is prone to a lot of uh, natural disasters, earthquake, floods, etc. So in 1940s, the Honduran government collaborated with the U.S. government to connect to vast majority of the land. And they built a bridge which can last any hurricane. So it's called the Choluteca Bridge. Okay, It's a very popular bridge in Honduras. Now, the several years, uh, I mean, decades later, it, that became a tourist destination of sorts. So decades later, another hurricane hit the country. Now, this time there was a lot of flooding. And uh, even after the hurricane, the bridge stayed intact. But do you know what happened? The river changed its course. Now you have a bridge with no water under the bridge. The river has changed its course. So we generally tell the story to tell that it is good. I mean, it is all, it, in the past, it was good to build to last. But now these days, you need to build to adapt. Adaptability is very important. So when... Uh, and a similar natural disaster, uh, I mean, a disaster hit all of us, right? Like when three years back, COVID. And if you had built your uh, uh, MarTech platforms or your technology platforms, enabling a lot of your data-driven decision-making, uh, you would have seen if you have built to adapt, you, you would have been able to add new data sources to your data foundation. You would have been able to take better intelligent decision making. And in, in the same case, if you have built a black box solution, uh, which was owned by different parties, then you would not have been able to make that change. And this was an important learning for us. At Mars, we are very clear, we are building our technology and capabilities to adapt. By that, it means that these capabilities are interoperable, these capabilities are breaking the silos. Uh, these capabilities are built in a reusable way. So uh, when the, the biggest challenge in the past used to be, hey, we were focusing on uh, 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 let's let's build a uh, solution which can last for a century. That's not going to happen uh, anymore. So those are some of the two big challenges that we are facing and how we are uh, addressing it on an ongoing basis. Thanks, Deepak. Um, Scott? Scott, you're on mute. Three years into a pandemic, and I still do that. Um, uh, I think the big challenges I see probably break down to two. Um, I think we've talked a lot about data, um, so I'm going to just riff on that one for one more second, which is 
I think that there is a lot of, especially in the media and entertainment space, but across the board and enterprises and everything, a lot of focus on people, ownership of data, who owns data, privacy that surrounds data, um, building profiles for audience and things like that. I think that the companies that recognize that having an open, especially with consumers and with users, um, and with partners and with brands and with themselves, uh, data strategy where they recognize that maybe they're not the best at building everything and sometimes to leverage others or partner with others. Uh, the ones that recognize that data, you said it earlier, is a source of currency, but data is also a source of truth. You and I could disagree, we all could disagree on the conclusions from data, but if we have a source of truth and level set, Everything can start from there and having that open dialogue is so critical. So that's the 1st 1. it sort of naturally transitions to the 2nd challenge that I see, which is. Where, where do we as an industry um, partner? Where do we build? Where do we reinvent the wheel? 1 of my frustrations of you know, being in the industry for a while has been that. Every single time somebody launches a streaming service, not every time often. Uh, somebody reinvents the wheel by recreating the television. It'd be like watching HBO one day and replacing the TV on your wall, then to swap it out to replace it with another TV to watch, I don't know, something on Netflix, right? I think that the more we can rely upon partners to help us to get to that type of scale that we need to, the more we can rely upon standards that are in the industry. Um, we talked about a few of them earlier, the more we can uh, grow together, then we lift all boats and right? everybody succeeds. And where I think sometimes the, some of the challenges has happened is where we try to recreate the wheel every single time. And that's okay if you're gonna build a better wheel, but sometimes it's okay to say, you know what? My focus is gonna be on being the most trusted uh, company in streaming and across the world, intergalactically, wherever we need to. And that's gonna be our focus. And maybe there's some other partnerships we can go in. An example helps. Uh, somebody, when I joined said, hey, we should be building an ad server. There are lots of great companies out there that build ad servers. We partnered with one, Magnet. You could go partner with Google. You could go partner with Freewheel. That's a good example of good synergies that exist, data. Is a good example of synergy. So I think that's a challenge that we're going to have to see out there in the space of how you sort of find the right platforms and solutions for everybody. Where, and I, like I said earlier, for customers and consumers, water finds its own level. Same thing happens for companies, especially as media companies transform, because I'm sure that they would love to be finding the best way to market, to find audiences, to create the best content and get that out there. And we and all the people here would love to help them. Kelly. So I think for me, there's two parts. I think when we think about CPG companies, a lot of the challenges is their uh, supply chain management platforms are outdated. And this, you know, there's a new system that needs to be implemented that is heavily driven by technology and becoming more digital first. And I think a lot of brands because of the pandemic are investing so much now in new supply chain management, which is fantastic. This is a long-term mm -hmm. process for them. So we're gonna see, we're gonna need to see the effects of that, which will come much later, even though I think there's this hope that it would happen sooner, but it's gonna be more of a long-term approach. Um, so that's first and foremost, when we think about CPG brands, but I also think from uh, some challenges that we face on, on the CPG side is that a lot of these brands are 100 plus year old companies. So they're rooted in their measurement in terms of MMM studies, uh, which is favoring mass reach vehicles at efficient costs. So when we think about getting brands on board to be more digital first, uh, it really takes a lot of education and testing and showcasing the value of different data sets that we're activating against through digital measurement in order to prove out the value there. So. You know, it's it's difficult from some of our other verticals that are moving much more quickly and don't heavily rely on those MMM studies and are very digital first that are really progressing at a much faster rate. You know, 
particularly with audio, since that's uh, a huge area of focus for me and at SXM Media. But I think that that's a lot of the challenges that we face in conversations of how do we get brands going from this more traditional old school model to really embracing um, digital transformation and leaning into data sets, testing, iterating, like it's not as it used to be, like here's your one message that for a mass reach uh, tactic, we can get super targeted and have new brand buyers, brand buyers, category buyers, new messages in order to grow your household penetration. So there's so much complexity there that we're educating our clients on, but it's how do we bridge the gap between the two? And that's a lot of the conversations that I focus on a day in and day out basis. Thank you. Thank you. Stacey? Well, I'm, I'm a little different. We're speaking to an audience offering entertainment. So right now we're not advertising anything unless our sponsors come in and ask us to. So we're just trying to speak to the audience through digital and social media. That's .com. That's, you know, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. I mean, TikTok sometimes maybe for most of not this group. But I, I think it's just a different world than trying to get tuned in to, you know, Crime Junkie. I think I go back to that because I also love Crime Junkie. And trying to get people to purchase. What is that sales funnel of? you catch their attention, you show them the product, you entice them because they recognize the m and figures. And then when they're actually at a point of sale, are they going to purchase? So my job is a little bit different. It's just to resonate, create brand awareness. So I think it's both easier and harder than, than actually having that firm data set of like, yes, we have a plus in sales or a plus in listeners. I just have to be attuned very detailed on, oh, did my copy resonate? Did my video make sense to them? Was that cool? Was that different enough? Um, and it really just depends on the consumer. So we, again, have to be very agile sometimes. Hey, maybe this month it works, maybe next month it doesn't. Um, so yes, we're always iterating. We're always changing. We're always adapting. Um, and the consumers get to tell us what we need to do, which is exciting and you got to keep you on your toes. Thank you. Marco? I think, you know, um, a lot of it is the human tendency not to want to lose control. Um, and I think that uh, this theme emerged when we talked about uh, how are we, uh, how are people going from uh, um, the got the decision making the marketers are used to the data driven i would say that the next step is how do they go out of data and go out of uh, gut uh, and into just trust ai because the thing is this uh, when i was at verizon we built a platform to decide what to show our consumers that took forty-two thousand plus uh, individual data points per second to decide what was the best action to take with our consumers no human can do it. And at the same time, the moment you tell somebody your job is now being done by what effectively is a black box, you are creating panic in the best possible case uh, and resentment in 90% of the others. Um, results when it's consumer are easy to prove because the cycle is so quick. Uh, in B2B, it takes a lot longer because the cycle between uh, awareness and purchase is typically measured in months. And so again, if I think about the challenges that I see for technology and uh, in general in this space, is the fact that we all know how this eventually will play out, which is just like none of us does multiplications on, piece, on a piece of paper and a pen if we have a calculator for our cell phone handy, and none of us checks that our calculator and and or cell phone are doing a multiplication right, we will end up with anything that can be quantified, being decided and managed directly by AI with no human intervention. How quickly, in which industries, in which scenarios first? That's the question. The second question is at what cost for the people that don't do it fast enough? Because again, you're competing against the machine and the machine is orders of magnitude faster and better than you 
because it's a machine. Does make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Um, we'll switch on to the questions. We have a couple of questions from audiences. So um, the first one is. Could you provide some good examples of, and I know some, some of these things we have already covered, but there'll be some repetition here, uh, but we, it is good to uh, summarize and consolidate for uh, as an answer to our uh, audiences. Could you provide some good examples of media companies using data analytics and AI to better understand their audiences and create more personalized content? So Deepak, we start with you. <laughs> Yeah, I think uh, probably um, not not a media company perspective, but more of a man uh, brand perspective that I can share. So uh, at Mars, we are building out our first party uh, data. We, we call it the CDC, Consumer Data Consolidation. So uh, that's a, a significant initiative which the Mars uh, regulatory team is undertaking and it is giving uh, our team access to a lot of individual consumer IDs. Now, leveraging this consumer ID, we are able to do a lot of personalization. Now, I think uh, 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 one example that I can uh, highlight for you is that I think um, if you have not done this in the past, I think I would encourage all of you to uh, go to uh, mnms.com, do some uh, uh, I mean, try to uh, get a customized product for you once. And I think then the next time when you go to mnms.com or if you are engaging with our brand in general, we try to leverage some of your information so that we can give you some personalized experiences as you are going through the journey. So this is something that we are doing and we are making a lot of progress. I think uh, one of the biggest aspects enabling this uh, within our team is our partnership from our Mars side. Uh, with our media team, our data and analytics team, with our media partners. And I think everybody work, works hand in hand to drive that uh, experience for our consumers. So I think uh, this is something that I can uh, share about how, uh, from a brand standpoint, how we are uh, giving a personalized experience. Now, uh, I am part of Mars on the snacking or uh, the chocolate side of the business. We have a significant business on the pet care side as well. So on, on the pet care side, our pet care lead uh, analytics team has built out a pet data ecosystem, uh, which is very important. I think I'll uh, speak about it for 30 seconds as well. So uh, our pet care ecosystem not only really have pet nutrition products like uh, Pedigree or Royal Canin, it also have pet hospitals, which like VCA, Banfield, and it has other uh, equipments, like uh, we have a product called Whistle, which I call as the Fitbit for pets. So when it comes to personalizing, uh, uh, I mean, we have much more data available as part of the pet data platform, and we are able to do more customized uh, uh, targeting to our pet parents and our pets when we are uh, uh, sharing these capabilities. Now, the, uh, I mean, this, there are multiple aspects different depending on different divisions of Mars. The maturity is also different as well. Sure. Thank you. Scott. Remember to shut off the mute button. Um, so good example of data and that'll lead to you AI. I think seeing a lot of uh, experiences starting to be built around optimizing to the conversation we had earlier. Uh, with Kelly and Marco about optimizing advertising to maximize audience uh, engagement, right? If I know you're watching, uh, you know, a novella and after the first seven minutes, there's a natural break, can I create a good hook that says, wait a second, hold on. If I look at the data, if I see that people get to minute 15, I'm hooked, then maybe I stop doing the advertising earlier and insert it at a later point because now at that point I've, I'm, I'm engaged. Or on uh, an user experience that after you watch one episode of a show, now you're onto the second one, you're binging. Maybe your tolerance for advertising changes there. That's one place where I've seen a lot of uh, use of data specifically. And you'll see where it's going to get to AI in one second. 
The other example on data is connecting, you know, marketers who are trying to bring audiences in, whether that's for buying products, whether that's for watching content, whether that's for whatever, and looking at, you know, CPAs or CAC or SAC or whatever uh, acronym you want to choose for that, bringing them in, and then marrying that to lifetime value of the subscriber. Typically, and Deepak probably can speak to this more, you know, that was one team is worrying about acquisition, is one team that's worrying about engagement. Bringing them together allows you to build models and customers and cohort them that says, you know what, I may be acquiring these subscribers for less value now, but if I trust the data, the data is saying that they're going to consume less than the person I'm going to spend five times the amount to go get and bring them in. Why does this lead to AI? The two things you know inside of this is you're making lots of decisions against this and trying to optimize this. You could do this with humans, but never as a scale and scope. So the example that I talk about here is imagine watching a long form show and you get to a natural break. And instead of going to the next piece of content, maybe the AI engine figures out, well, you know what? Scott will be better served by showing him a highlight of Duke beating North Carolina, right? That would be the perfect highlight for Scott at this moment versus if I'm showing it to Stacy, Stacy's never gonna wanna see that. Why don't we serve her something else? Versus in the case of Callie showing her one ad and then going back to the content where the AI engine could help us construct content. Marco was talking about that earlier. That's even more out there and that'd be incredible or incorporating brands. But let's just start some simple ones, which is how about the viewing experience for me changes relatively to the viewing experience for everybody. And that uses a foundation of data, you have to have source of truth, and then starts to build those models towards creating new experiences. And I'm really excited about seeing that. You could do multiple languages, you could do different experiences, you could do new forms of content, all by taking data as a foundation and then layering this idea on top of it. Yeah, I think what you're saying, Scott, I will build on in this respect, that uh, first of all, the short answer in my case is TikTok by orders of magnitude. And the reason is this, which is what everybody describes as an addictive experience is an hyper personalized experience that is grounded on data on the content. And keep in mind that the content is crowdsourced. So it need to be via AI classified and categorized. And then it needs to be served based on what I have watched previously. So the problem is you use AI both to identify what content falls into a bucket and what content is the most appropriate for scope. Now, if you think about it in the long video format, what this says is not only that I can show a different ad to Scott and or to Stacy at the same time, but that I should be able to decide that Scott's ad is going to be served at this point, whereas Stacy is going to continue to watch the movie at that point, and Stacy is going to have a break at a different point. Maybe because Scott has proven to be less finicky than Stacy, he's going to get five times the ads because I can um, to Kali's point and he's not going to be too much annoyed. Whereas, you know, Stacy is not. Maybe if I'm going to be completely stereotypical and politically incorrect, Scott is going to be willing to tolerate a hell of a lot more ads if he's watching, uh, um, I don't know. Mission Impossible versus is it watching Harry versus Sally. Um, I'm, that, I'm those are the type of things, <laughs> exactly. Those are the type of things that essentially are grounded in the capability that AI gives us to, one, absorb dynamically video, categorize it and take, and then two, take informed decisions based both on what we know about the content and what we know about the audience. Um, hundred percent. And I would say for us too, I mean, one of the things that I was thinking through uh, as we were going to have this discussion today is, you know, there is that side, there's the content and how it's served. And then there's also the, the ad experience that goes along with it. And one of the things that excites me the most, and I, you know, we don't talk enough about 
at SXM Media, but is really uh, the Music Genome Project, which I don't know if anyone knows about that, but it's really what powers Pandora. And it's an incredibly effective technology platform. I mean, it was a colossal effort. There were uh, to classify songs, they use over 400 genetic markers and that gets applied to each song to help create a taxonomy of music. Um, and this has been over two decades with musicologists analyzing these attributes so we can serve the right song at the right time for the individual listener. And it really is about combining best in class technology, but also applying a human touch to the data. I think that's something we haven't really discussed much of today, but there is that human touch and uh, allowing us to serve that right song or that right you know, podcast to our listener base is really important and has been a huge contributing factor to our success as a platform in bringing consumers in because we give you uh, great recommendations as a result. So that's just something that we've been working on too and it really powers our platforms. And then we can also deliver personalized ads experience. We know what consumers are listening to. We know what they're thumbs up in. We know what they want to engage in. And then we can create that personalized experience with less ads, but more personalized ads as a result. So those are two things that I'm really excited about. We already have those existing and they keep getting better as the technology improves, but I really do see that as a, a powerful um tool in our arsenal. And just to answer the last question in terms of what I'm excited about uh, in terms of the tech space, I think a year ago, we had a ton of clients asking us about NFTs. What's going on in this space? What are other brands doing? Because you'd see brands popping up left and right entering the NFT space. And so I put together a mini narrative and even, you know, Frank's red so Red Hot Sauce was coming in the into play and Charmin and all these other examples where you wouldn't have thought that these types of brands would be entering this space. But uh, there was a lot of testing. I don't think there has been much traction in there since. We haven't heard a lot of clients speaking about this since. So, uh, you know, while it was an exciting place to play in about a year ago, I'm not sure that I'm seeing the same traction that we were seeing about a year ago. So I do think it is going to be doubling down on data AI, how do we get the most out of uh, these technology sources to uh, serve the best uh, user experience for our clients? Because ultimately that's going to be the most important to build for it, brand loyalty. Thank you. Stacey, we'll uh, be out Wonderful. I'm so glad that you mentioned Pandora because I think that is one of the best examples of catering to the consumer. Because I think, mm -hmm. I don't know, the human genome project, I'm glad that you mentioned that, but it truly is catering to a person's taste and you can in real time give feedback, whether you like or you don't like a song so that they mm -hmm. can continue to evolve and, and adapt to your, your preferences. I think another group that does that really well is retail. Um, I'm specifically thinking about Nike and ThreadUp is another example. It's a, an online consignment shop. They don't necessarily advertise but they have this omni-channel presence. So they have an app, they have a .com, they have personalized forms that you can go in. So they're only offering you items that have your size. If they think you're gonna like something, they're gonna push it up on their website or their app. There's actually heat mapping that's happening in real time for people either of an age group or in a different country or of your personal profile that they are moving items around on the app and on .com to make sure that you are being served exactly what they think you might buy. So it's kind of creepy, but it's also really exciting as a, as a consumer because you can log on and you don't have to scroll through a million different things that you don't like, which you're gonna most likely lose focus, which brings us back to that book that you mentioned. You're gonna lose focus before you actually purchase something. And then answering the the what excites me, um, I'm excited about AR and VR. I think particularly in the media and entertainment space, going back to that second and third screen chat, um, we're going to be wanting something else to capture the attention. So let's say, I mean, let's use the M&M store as, as our example. If I'm in the M&M store and I have a gluten allergy, I want to be able to scan the QR code and look at my second screen to see all of the ingredients to make sure that it's safe for me to eat. Um, and then 
it can show you exactly either in picture form or in list form, but it's catering to the consumer to make sure that everything is how I need and want it to be purchased. And then if we talk about sports, um, if I want to watch a replay in slow-mo and I miss it on the broadcast and I can go to the app and press replay, and what if I can project it on my own wall or watch it in real time if the, let's say the Oculus comes back from Facebook, watch it in real time in 3D. Like how cool would that be to be standing right there watching this replay in 3D play out in front of me and then take my my Oculus off and then go back to watching the game. I think perhaps who knows what that's going to be. Someone just mentioned the Jetsons to me when I said that the other day. They're like, oh, but that's way too far in the future. I'm like, yeah, but technology is always evolving. We're always changing. Think about 20, 25 years ago, I wouldn't have a job because nothing that I do existed 20 to 25 years ago. So I'm pretty excited about what, well, what that's like, yeah. And, sp <laughs> and Stacey, I, I really loved uh, the example that you gave. I think uh, one broader, and I think this is one of the question that uh, got asked about AI and the ethics of AI, the data collection, et cetera. I think it is important as leaders driving this transformation to have a responsible AI strategy. Now, uh, this is uh, at, at Mars, we are spending a lot of time to build AI for good in partnership with our strategic partners. Uh, when, it, uh, when it comes to technology, when it comes to data and analytics, et cetera. I think that is one aspect that we need to think about when we uh, talk about AI. For us, uh, when we are building out the responsible AI strategy, uh, we are thinking uh, a lot hard about how can we collect the data with keeping the uh, regulations in mind when it comes to CCPA or GDPR, uh, how can we uh, store and securely store the data that is something that we are actively thinking about you guys would have definitely he heard about the challenges related to cambridge analytica so, uh, it was one of the biggest topic uh, post election cycle a uh, few years back and I, I think this is something that we need to actively think about so as we at mars as we are building out the responsible ai strategy we are thinking about the ai code of conduct what is the governance uh, that we are going to put in place to take out the unconscious bias that might happen in the AI models. How can we think about diversity and inclusion? Now, if you uh, go to one of the open AI capabilities like DALI, who, which is uh, helpful in creating uh, uh, images, you uh, do a search for uh, 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 an executive in an American multinational who is the chief executive officer the image always comes as a Caucasian man. And that is not the case. Like the, the AI is built on the historical data. So taking out the implicit bias, the unconscious bias is going to be very important. How can we build in the gender diversity when it comes to the right kind of modeling uh, equations that we are putting in place? And more importantly, the transparency in the AI, that is going to be another important aspect because all of us are going to actively leverage AI capabilities in the future. And because of the unconscious bias in the historical data or the bias in the historical data, we might, I mean, unless until the AI algorithms are transparent, we might take some wrong decisions, right? Like, I mean, which might be bad for our brands, bad for our companies. So I think building responsible AI in the heart of our strategy is also going to be really important. Um, I think we are we are almost on the top of the hour uh, now. Um, any last points? Uh, you know, uh, there are any last thoughts uh, you guys have uh, to share with the customer before I hand it over, Nitin. I think one thing which uh, uh, some some of you guys have covered, but privacy and security is also one of the topic which uh, some of the uh, audience have asked. So, any thoughts on that? Uh, last uh, last thoughts. We have two three minutes left. I think that's worth a whole other panel on its own. <laughs> <laughs> I agree with you. 
I think I, I think we I think we all started to touch upon it briefly, yeah. right? Like we talked about privacy, we talked about the types of information that's going to be needed. We talked about how data is going to have to change along the way, how advertising is going to have to change, how TV has an advantage in some ways against that. Like there's a lot of things. I think totally a different topic, different day. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. I agree. No, but I think uh, uh, thank you so much for your great insights uh, and all the speakers. It was a great session hosting you guys, and I hand over to Nitin again. Thank you, thank you, Ashish. And, you know, thanks, Deepak. Thanks, Marco, Stacy, Kelly, Scott. You know, it was a lovely panel discussion we just now witnessed in in the you know, media transformation and you know how the things are changing. Thanks a lot for giving your inputs, and it was a very insightful session. Uh, just to wrap up, you know, we would like to thank all our community partners, speakers, and the attendees you know, who took time, came together for enriching knowledge through this forum. As we had said, great set of panel speakers who came together to share thoughts. Just for your information, today's event was broadcasted in the YouTube page of our company, so you all can go and see the recording anytime. Please log on to our website and like the social media channels. We'll be sharing lots of knowledge sharing topics, announcement of next events, details, and much more, which will help you register and attend the quality events. Also, we would like to thank InfoVision, which is our knowledge and innovation partner, and Digit7, which is technology partner. To understand more in depth, connect with them. All of you can go through their website, which is infovision.com, and closely liaison with them. Further, there are lots more in store for this year with focus on a lot of industries where technology is there like banking, finance, insurance, telecom, retail, healthcare, supply chain, manufacturing, energy, utility, and so on. So request all of you to keep connected with us and enjoy the learning. Thanks and do take good care of yourself. Have a lovely day and great week ahead, guys. Thank we'll you. connect with all of you very shortly. Take care, guys. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.